Good evening, everyone. A very warm welcome to our service this evening. Whether you're here in the church or participating online, we're pleased to have you with us. I should say that I received an email uh, very shortly after the service this morning from a lady in Northern Ireland who had enjoyed uh, the uh, service. So a lot of people, a lot of people tune in. Uh, we're, we're online. We're reaching, reaching the world. Uh, I would remind you that we're having an after-church fellowship this evening, which will start 15 minutes or so uh, after the service concludes. So if you're watching us on YouTube, if you hop on to the Zoom link um, just after the uh, service ends, and we'll, we'll probably start the after-service fellowship about, about 7.15, when it shouldn't go on beyond 8. And uh, please do feel free to ask questions uh, when we come to that time. And perhaps when we come back in to the church after the service. Perhaps if we could congregate uh, in the middle, that would, uh, that would uh, help uh, proceedings. So just moving on to the evening service, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, uh, Matthew Guy back to our pulpit. And uh, Matthew, we've enjoyed having you with us this past couple of weeks and look forward to worshiping God with you this evening again. Thank you. Thank you, Donald. It's been a, a wonderful uh, privilege to be here last Sunday and today, and we uh, very much enjoyed uh, being able to stay in the manse, so we're grateful to you all for your hospitality, uh, and, uh, and hope we won't be uh, strangers to this part of the world uh, and to you all. It's been a, a real privilege to uh, be with you. And it's a particular privilege to join again uh, once more to worship the Lord together. Uh, this evening, we come to consider how the God, God is the one true God, the living God, who alone is worthy of our worship. So allow me to read some words from Psalm 98 as we begin our time of worship together. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. God's salvation means that it is right to worship and praise him. And so it's appropriate that we stand to do that now. In the words that I've just read, are set metrically in Psalm 98 from Sing Psalms. So we'll stand and sing to our Lord and God together. Let's stand.
Let's join our hearts in prayer together. Let's pray. Father God, as we meet once again in the name of the Lord Jesus to worship and to praise you, we give you thanks that as we've just been singing, you're a God of salvation, you're a God of great and steadfast love. We give you thanks for how you have brought deliverance by your right hand alone, ultimately by sending your most beloved son into the world to pay the price for our sins to rise from the dead, to ascend to your right hand, to demonstrate his authority and power as we were privileged to reflect on this morning. And so we give you thanks again that it is a true privilege to meet in the name of Jesus, to offer our worship and our praise to you. Father, even as we acknowledge you to be a holy God, a God who is worthy of right and undivided worship, and yet so we confess that often our hearts are divided, that our worship is not what it should be, that our lives in many ways fail to point towards your glory and majesty. And we confess that in our sin we feel you through ignorance, through weakness, even through our own deliberate faults. And we confess that there are many good things which we feel to do, there are many wrong things which we continue to do. And so we bring our many sins before you this evening. We pray that you would forgive us. We pray that you would restore to us the joy of salvation, the joy of knowing Christ, of knowing that our sins are truly forgiven as we come to put our trust in him. And we pray that in our time together, you would Assure us that as our trust is in Christ, so we can have true confidence that we can approach you boldly, trusting in his perfect righteousness, trusting in his pure and perfect and undivided worship, even where we know that we feel. And so we pray that our time together will be one of joy as we sing your praise and feed on your word together. We pray as well that this wouldn't be true just for this evening. We pray that as we consider the remains of this day, and as we look to the week ahead. Father, by your Holy Spirit, take the truths of your word that we're privileged to reflect on in this meeting, plant them deep within our hearts, and cause us to delight in and to worship you every day in the week ahead, and all the days that we walk with Christ. All these things we ask and pray in the name of Jesus, and to your glory and praise. Amen. Well, it's a wonderful privilege to be able to call to God on, to call to God in prayer, to even confess our sins with confidence that He hears and delights to answer our prayer as we ask Him for forgiveness. And we know that this is true because of what the Lord Jesus has done, that God has shown His love for us in sending Christ. And so we're going to stand and sing again, here is love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. We stand and sing to delight in God's steadfast love and kindness towards us in Christ. Let's stand and sing.
as we sit, we will turn to read from God's Word. Uh, Two readings for us this evening. Uh, The first is in Exodus chapter 20, where we'll read from verses 4 to 6. And then if you're following along in your own Bible, then do stick a thumb in Exodus 20 and also turn to Colossians chapter 1, where we'll be reading from verses 15 to 23. So Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 to 6, and then Colossians chapter 1, 15 to 23. God said, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. And then Colossians chapter 1, and I'll read from verse 15 to 23. Paul writes, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation, If you continue in your faith, established and firm, and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard heard, and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. Amen. We thank God for his word. We pray that he would bless its reading and its teaching to us. And before we come to consider God's word together again, we will stand and sing once more. Uh, we stand to sing that in Christ alone, our hope is found. God is worthy of our praise and worship because in Christ alone, he has won salvation for us. So let's stand and sing together.
let's join together in prayer as we turn to look at God's Word. Our Father God, we thank you that you alone are worthy of our worship and praise, that we thank you that you alone have saved us in sending Christ. And so we pray that as we come to study your word together, you would help us to delight more in you and what you've done for us. And we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts and minds would be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, we're back in Exodus, like we were last week, looking at the second commandment this time around. And we consider, as we begin, a foundational truth of the Christian life, that God doesn't just save us and then leave us to get on with things. No, one of the foundational truths of being a Christian, being a follower of Jesus, is that when God saves us, He saves us for service. That's something that was true of, of um, Israel in the Exodus, back in Exodus chapter 20. It's true of us today. God saves people so that they can worship Him and walk with Him in faith and obedience. That's why there's a famous book, a commentary on Exodus, and the title is Saved for Service. That's what God does. He saves people to serve and glorify and walk with and worship Him. And so as we rejoin Israel this evening, encamped around Mount Sinai, hearing these ten words from God for the first time, we need to realize that they have a big decision to make. The big decision for them, and also for us, is now that you have been saved, who then will you serve? Will you serve the living God who has redeemed you? Or will you serve idols that you've made for yourselves? So hopefully we can see how this is a natural follow-on from the first commandment, the commandment to have no other gods before Yahweh. And where that was dealing with the issue of divided worship, here in the second commandment, we're considering improper worship. That's what's being spoken against here. And we'll see together this evening, I hope, that the offense of empty idols is set against, once again, the heart of the living God. And as we do that compare and contrast exercise, we'll see that He indeed alone is to be worshipped. So those are the two things we're going to see, the offense of empty idols and also the heart of of the living God. So let's first consider together the offense of empty idols. And we see in verse 4 that the presenting issue for Israel is the issue of images. Uh, God says, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. Now that means that right away we need to clarify something about this word in verse 4, image. Uh, some take this verse to mean that any images of anything at all are completely forbidden. So, yes, a, a picture of God would be a big no-no in a church building, but also a picture of anything, whether it be a tree or a river or whatever else you might have. No images should be allowed is what some people will think when they read this verse. But we know that that can't be the case because just a few chapters later in Exodus, when God gives instructions for the tabernacle, where His people are to come and worship Him, we see that that is full of images. Images from the natural world of, of fruit, pomegranates, and that kind of thing. Images uh, that are meant to uh, cast the mind heavenwards as well. So the tabernacle is full of images, palm trees, flowers, cherubim, all those kinds of things. God wouldn't then forbid something in Exodus chapter 20 only to expressly command it just a short while later. That would go against what he'd said previously. No, the, the issue in verse 4, it's not with images full stop. The Hebrew is more literally talking about carved images. 
That's what's the issue here. That term carved images, that is shorthand for a very specific thing. Uh, namely, when we see carved images coming up throughout the Old Testament, we're to think of idols carved out of wood or hewn from stone or cast in bronze. Images, idolatrous images, which were used to represent gods in worship practices. Uh, that's what's being spoken against here. The grammar is slightly clunky, especially in Hebrew, but also in our English translations. But verses 4 and 5, they actually go hand in hand. It's not don't make images, commandment 1, and also commandment 2, don't worship images. No, it's don't make idols to bow down and worship them. Don't make images for the purpose of worship. Now, that, of course, means that making images that represent some of the gods of the nations around Israel is being prohibited against. Dagon and Baal and Ashtoreth and any other god of Canaan, that's clearly wrong. We already saw that last week in the first commandment. Israel is to have no other god except for Yahweh, their god. But this commandment also means that it is wrong to worship images even if they represent God himself and even if they're being used with the very best of intentions. If we were to flick forward to Exodus chapter 32, that we'd have a scene of Israel impatient with Moses up on the mountain meeting with God and so asking Aaron, his brother-in-law, to make images for them. We read there, um, this is Exodus 32, I'm beginning at chapter 4, Aaron took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, What's wrong with that picture? What's wrong with that scene? Well, remember last week, we talked about how seismic an event the Exodus was. How the Exodus was the defining and the enduring reminder of God's unique, steadfast, covenant-keeping love to His people. And yet here, there in Exodus 32, we have the people saying, these are the gods who brought us out of Egypt. We have even Aaron saying, tomorrow will be a festival to the Lord, to Yahweh, clearly implying that bowing down in front of the calf is the same as worshipping the living gods. I take it that we know how offensive that is to God how entirely inappropriate to equate worshipping an image of a created thing with worshipping the Creator, to ascribe glory for the great saving work that only God has done to a bit of metal. It's clearly not acceptable. If we read verse 7 of 32, we read that the Lord said to Moses, Go down, because your people whom you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. Corrupt is what the Lord describes that worship as, which is interesting because even a really sincere attempt to say, this is really going to help me in my worship of God and help me to give him the glory, we've no reason to doubt that Aaron is being deeply sincere in saying we should worship the Lord Yahweh. Yes, we'll be bowing down to a calf, but really what we mean is that we're worshiping the true and living God. We don't need to doubt his sincerity but it's still offensive and corrupting before God. So if any attempt to worship a created thing, a false thing, even if we're saying that that represents our true and living God, is offensive in his sight, it's clear enough to see how for Israel, bowing down in front of a golden calf was a wrong thing to do. That's obvious for us. 
After all, the list of how idols are different from the living God is about as long as my arm. I mentioned one already. He's the creator. They're created things. Uh, He speaks. They're dumb. Uh, He sees. They're blind. And that list goes on and on and on. The literal opposite in so many ways. The creator and the created. But I don't think that's a particular danger for us. That specific danger of bowing down in front of an image or a statue I've had the privilege of leading us in prayer this evening. I think if earlier on I'd said, let's pray, and as I did that, I wheeled out a big golden statue of a cow and said, let's bow down to that, you would have some comments to make about that, and I hope you would make them quickly and loudly if I tried to do that. I don't think that's a particular specific danger that we face in church life today. But I also take it that there is more than one way of constructing a false god. Not just through literal, physical images, but also through our imaginations. Glenn Scrivener, the Australian evangelist, tells a story about how he was going to preach at an evangelistic service in a church. People were inviting a lot of their friends in the community, community to come and hear the gospel, and he'd been speaking to a man in the church and saying, could, could you give us a title for your talk? And he said, yeah, why don't you call it, um, if God were to turn up today, what would he be like? And that was it. Didn't think anything more of it. Didn't want to have any input in the publicity. Trusted the church to get on with it. So a few weeks later, as he was driving into this town and driving towards the church, to his horror, he saw this giant billboard outside the church with the title, if God were to turn up today, what would he be like? And a big picture of his face and Glenn Scrivener in big, bold lettering. And he thought, oh no, something's gone slightly wrong here if people think that if God turned up today, he'd be like me. Now again, I don't think we're in particular danger of equating Glenn Scrivener with God. But I do wonder if that question is a revealing one. If God turned up today, what would he be like? That can reveal a lot about what our heart attitudes towards God are. That can reveal how there's a a subtle danger of having a really individualized approach to, to how we understand God and his character and his purposes. And it can mean that even with the very best of intentions, things which we might feel bring us much closer to God, actually end up up driving us further and further away from Him. If we have an attitude which is not uncommon in our world today of saying, well, for me, God is like this or that, it can be quite dangerous territory to be on. We often see that in the media, don't we? We see stories of churches who are going against God's moral law, and we see people being interviewed who will say, well, I like to think of God as a loving grandfather in the sky who's smiling on everything that I do. I don't think he'd have any issue with this. Maybe even sometimes we go to a trusted Christian friend and we confess to them that we're struggling with a particular sin. We want them to hold us to account and to speak gospel truth to us. And again, with the best of intentions, wanting to offer some comfort, they might say, well, you know, I like to think of God as my friend, my my close pal. And any good friend just wants you to be happy. You don't need to worry too much about this sin stuff. That's quite a dangerous place to be too. And there are many other ways that we can construct a false image of God in our minds. We can take one aspect of God's character and overemphasize it to the exclusion of other things. So uh, we overemphasize his love so that he never makes any demands of us, or we overemphasize his wrath so that he's always angry at the people I dislike and disagree with. Or instead of overemphasizing, we can downplay, we can edit out and ignore parts of how God has revealed himself in his word because they don't sit comfortably with us. We can think, well, I I just couldn't possibly worship a God who would, and complete that sentence in any number of ways, with any number of Bible verses that we don't understand or don't care for. But friends, any time we construct an image of God and say, 
that's the God I want to worship. It's a deeply offensive thing to him. It's deeply wrong. The theologian Jim Packer puts it like this. He writes, it needs to be said with the greatest possible emphasis that those who hold themselves free to think of God as they like are breaking the second commandment. At best, they can only think of God in the image of man, as an ideal man, perhaps, or a superman. But God is not any sort of man. We were made in his image, but we must not think of him as existing in ours. Packer is hitting on a very important aspect of this commandment. We actually don't need to think of what God might be like. We don't need to construct an image of him in our heads because we have the image of God. God already has an image. Now, in a sense, Every single one of us is God's image bearer. We're all made in his image. That's a big Bible term with lots of implications. But one of them, one of the most profound ones, is that we're able to know God and to relate to him and that we've been appointed to rule over this world by him. For Israel then, that makes image worship all the more baffling because they're not only worshiping something far lesser than God when they bow down to a golden calf, they're actually worshiping something far less than even themselves as God's image bearers. But we also know that our imaging of God isn't perfect. It's marred by sin. That's when it becomes really good news that we read in Colossians that Christ is the image of the invisible God. The Lord Jesus is the only image of God to whom people should bow down in thankful worship. If we follow the images of God that we construct in our minds, that doesn't get us anywhere. Because all we're doing is following our own flawed and crooked and sinful hearts and the things that they want to construct. But if we follow Jesus, the image of God, that's where we find the door open to true worship. And that cuts two ways for us as we consider it this evening. If we are at all guilty of making a God in our own minds, following our own list of criteria for pleasing him, well, we need to make sure that we are looking daily to the life and teachings of the Lord Jesus. It is only from him as we meet him in the pages of scripture that we can be truly certain that we're worshiping the true God truly. So there's a challenge for us to make sure that our worship is always in line with what we encounter in the Bible. But there's also a word of encouragement here. Because if we've drawn up an idea of God in our minds, a God who's impossible to please, maybe a God who we've, without even realizing it, based on an overbearing parent or a strict school teacher we once knew, maybe even a God we were introduced to by people claiming to follow and love him many years ago. A God who is always angry, a God who is never pleased with anything we do, a God who always wants us to feel downbeat and downtrodden. Well, if that's the case, then it's as we gaze at the Lord Jesus, we see once again that his burden is very light Yes, we must follow and obey him. The Christian life is one of obedience, of sacrifice, of of course those things are all true and I don't wish to downplay any of that. But fundamentally, our worship is made acceptable, made even pleasing to God if we put our trust in Jesus. That's really good news for us. It's another motivating thing to not follow the God that we construct in our heads because that God can't save us. The God who can, the God who has saved us in sending the Lord Jesus 
delights to hear our prayers, delights to accept our worship, not because of who we are, but because of what he has done in Christ. And if we're not convinced on this, then hopefully our second point will help us a lot. And we've, we've seen the emptiness of idols, <coughs> I beg your pardon, and we now turn to consider the heart of the living God. Because as I mentioned last week, when God gives commandments here in Exodus 20, he doesn't just command, he also reveals that each of these 10 words gives a snapshot of what God himself is like. And there are two aspects that he highlights for us here in the second commandment, which motivate our obedience of it. The first is his jealousy. And we see it in verse 5. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Now, we tend to think of jealousy as a negative thing. In our our sin-sick state, we often find the jealousy that we encounter in ourselves, in our own dark hearts, and in the world around us. It's quite a a grubby and dark thing. It's petty and small-minded, wanting stuff that other people have or wanting to deny other people good things. But wonderfully, God's jealousy isn't at all like our jealousy. God isn't the least bit petty or small-minded or vindictive or volatile. No, God's divine jealousy is entirely appropriate, (coughs) excuse me, because it's completely grounded in who he is and in what he's done for his people. Of course, of course he doesn't want to see them worshipping other gods, false gods who have done and can't do anything to save, to help, and to bless. Because he alone has saved, has promised to bless his people. To put it like this, a husband or wife who has done nothing but show love and care and dedication towards their spouse should feel a sense of jealousy over them. It would be totally devastating to see the person that you love setting their affections on another and chasing after them. Not being jealous there wouldn't be a sign of love and understanding. It would be a sign of complete cold indifference. And that's what it's like with God. His jealousy is entirely appropriate. And what goes hand in hand with that jealousy is the reality that there are consequences. If his people are unfaithful, if they break the covenant they've made with him, then it's because of his holy jealousy that there will be consequences As we read on in verse 5, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Now, again, God is not like us. He's not petty. He's not volatile. He doesn't bear grudges like we do. And actually, elsewhere in the Bible, God makes it very clear that he doesn't hold the sins of the father against the child as if they've committed the same sins themselves. What he is drawing his people in Exodus 20 here to consider, though, is the far-reaching consequences of their choice of who to worship in the here and now. Because we know, don't we, that the head of a family will inevitably set the kind of tone, the, the kind of atmosphere that the rest of the family breathe for a long, long time to come. I think a few of you have been able to get some cuddles with Billy uh, while we've been up here, uh, which I hope was a, a great joy for you. It's a joy for me every day. Uh, Billy, wee Billy, is named after Big Billy, my granddad, who sadly passed about 10 years ago. But We were very close, hence naming my son after him. And he was a a wonderful man. He was a man of great joy and compassion. And yet he was also of the the generation of of stoic Ulsterman, who for some reason always seemed, even at his happiest, to be slightly troubled by something. Now, this presented itself by routinely saying, oh, dear me. Doesn't matter what we were doing at the time. Maybe a, a family trip to the beach or a fun games night. You would hear Granda almost like punctuation, under his breath, oh dear me, all the time. I do that. I've had people round for a fun evening with friends saying to me, 
oh, are you okay? For no reason, you've just said, oh, dear me, under your breath. Are you feeling okay? Yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. My wee niece, who's recently turned three, when she was learning to speak, one of the first phrases she learned was, oh, dear me, oh, dear me, oh, dear me. That's a, a trivial example of how one man can set the atmosphere that a family breathes to the third and the fourth generation. That is trivial. It's not very serious. The word of warning in verse 5, though, is quite serious. God is telling his people that if they make the decision to trifle with idol worship, they won't just be inviting his displeasure on themselves. They'll be setting a really dangerous pattern of ungodliness that will stretch for years and years to come. And that will be especially true in a culture where three or four generations would often live together under the same roof. So there's a note of warning for them. And there's a note of warning for us too. For the parents among us, if, if we bring children up in an atmosphere where God is about the number five or six priority in home life, well, of course, we shouldn't be surprised if our children don't make him priority number one. For any among us who aren't, who aren't parents, though, I would say to you, don't underestimate the influence that you can have on young, watching eyes in church family as they crucially see faith modeled by spiritual aunties and uncles and grandparents. There's a note of warning for all of us then in, in how we choose to prioritize and, and model right worship of God to young hearts and minds who are watching. But primarily for all of us, whether we are parents or not, life worship of the living God as a top, top priority is something that we are all called to as individuals. And so if any of us needs more motivation, well, we're presented with a much better alternative as God reminds us once again that he is a God of steadfast love. Verse 6, or verse 5 again, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Verse 6, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. It's rendered as love in the NIV. The Hebrew is actually the word chesed. It means God's steadfast love, not love in a generic sense, but the particular covenant love that God has lavished upon his people. And we can see here just how abundant that steadfast love is. Where iniquity is visited for a limited and clearly defined time, the third and the fourth generation, God's steadfast love extends to thousands, thousands of generations. Well, that's the reassurance for Israel then, and also for us. That's the thing that we ought to put our hopes in. I'm going to assume that standing around Mount Sinai and, and hearing Moses read these words from the Lord for the first time, the average Israelite couldn't possibly have been standing there hearing each one and thinking, great, yeah, I've done that one, I've completed that one, I've done really well on that one. No, I imagine they probably heard the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words for the first time, and maybe especially this, this warning against idolatry, and felt deeply challenged, deeply convicted about how they had been guilty of transgressing in all those ways. After all, as they heard the second commandment, they had literally just been found worshipping a golden calf before Moses read the commandments. I take it that we will inevitably feel a bit like that too. Anytime we come to God's law, we thought a bit last week about how it exposes our sin and it lays it bare. And maybe even now we're conscious of how we don't put God first in family life or even in any sphere of life. You may even be here this evening as someone who has never considered God at all. And I want to remind you of something I said last week, that the first step is to receive God's steadfast love. We don't earn it through obeying the Ten Commandments. We receive it as a gift. We trust in Jesus, like I was saying earlier. We follow him. 
We make him the Lord of our lives. If this is the first time you've felt challenged by how you feel to worship the true God rightly, then that's the response that's needed, not a list of effortful things you're going to do, but a commitment to follow and to trust in the Lord Jesus. But for all of us who've already received God's steadfast love in Christ, the message for us is clear. Trust in it. Do not stray from it. As far as we are made aware of our divided loyalties, as far as we are made aware of our tendency to make God in our own image, as far as we are made aware of our failure to make right worship of the living God our top priority, yes, it's right that we repent and ask for God's help and lean again into his steadfast love. We mentioned earlier that we don't image God perfectly. A little bit later in the book of Colossians, after the the chunk that we read, we have this deeply reassuring promise for those in Christ that we have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. It's not a commandment. It's not put off the old self and put on the new self. It's a description of what the Christian is. Someone who has put off the old self. Someone who has put on the new self, which is being renewed more and more into the image of Christ every day. So if we've received God's steadfast love in Christ, we have confidence that he really, truly has changed us. The old idolatrous self is gone. And we have confidence that he is continuing to change us, working in our hearts by his spirit each day to grow us in our devotion to him. And so that's reassuring for us tonight because it makes even our weak and divided and half-hearted efforts into worship that is good and pleasing. That's good news for us. There will, of course, be things that are exposed in our own hearts that we need to repent of, and there will be behaviors that we may need to change. But our our trust is that as we know and love Jesus, that is the thing that ultimately makes our worship good and pleasing in God's sight. Not anything that we can do, what he has done for us. And so because of God's steadfast love then, we can approach him and we can ask for his forgiveness and help for the many ways, the many times in which we feel and get this wrong. And because of his steadfast love, we are drawn again to want to worship him when we see that the burden he's laying on us isn't to try really, really hard to make ourselves acceptable, It's to know and love and follow and trust the Lord Jesus and worship God in and through him. As we come to close then, we consider another story in the history of Israel. As they enter the promised land, Joshua lays this challenge before God's people. Choose this day whom you will serve. Will they serve the false gods of the people of Canaan? or the living God who has brought them to this place. The God who has time and again shown his steadfast love to them. And similarly then, for us as we close, we need to consider that choice now and each day. We've seen God's steadfast love for us in Christ. If our trust is in him, we know it and we have it each day. And so we consider then, do we really want to even want to serve the false gods that we draw up in our own heads? Or do we find our hearts more and more wanting to serve the living God whose steadfast love far exceeds anything we could ever hope to imagine? With that in mind, let me lead us in prayer as we close. God, our Father, we thank you that as we've been reflecting, we can approach you in prayer. 
we can approach you in worship, knowing that these things are good and pleasing in your sight, not because of the effort that we put in, not because of the eloquence with which we phrase our prayers or the uh, volume with which we sing your praises, but only because of your steadfast love towards us in Christ, in whom we approach you boldly, knowing that we are forgiven, knowing that we are adopted as sons. And so we pray as you make us more and more conscious of all you've done for us in him, that you would draw us away each day from the temptation to worship false gods, help us to delight more and more in worshiping you. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. We do need to pray ongoingly that God will help us to worship him truly, and we're going to do that in the words of our final song, a prayer that God would be our vision in this night and in the week ahead. Let's stand and sing, Be Thou My Vision. to him who is able to keep us from stumbling and to present us blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory majesty dominion and authority before all time and now and forever amen